and welcome to tonight's Shia, Moshe Shabbos, Parshas Tildes. And so we'll go straight into a, something very interesting viewer, not our question of halacha, which I came across this week. We have on Shmini Atzeres and on, on Shmini Atzeres on Mus, at Musaf, when we switch over to start saying Masha Baruch Merida Geshem, we have a poem in Musaf, in the repetition of Musaf, and it's attributed to Belezer Aliri, and the there's a whole uh, there's six stanzas here, and they correspond to. The first one is referring to Avram Avinu, Ovnim Shachacharech Hakamayim. The second one is Yitzchok, who was born by the Besoyer of Yukach Nomat Mayim. The third one is Yaakov, who crosses the, the, the uh, water, the Yardain, with his um, staff. This fourth one is Moshe Rabbeinu, drawn from, in, in a basket from the water. And we have the fifth one is Ya'arin, who travels in, in the uh, as the Korean God travels seven times on, on, on sorry, five times on, on Yom Kippur and then we've got the the yeah, 12 Shvotim who were um, they were de delivered across uh, the, the Yamsuf in tunnels of water the question which uh, is which was is asked is we see that there's the chorus it looks like the original idea was that the chazan would say the main stanza and the the congregation would respond with the call it a chorus if you want and they would say here they would say here they would say so we have it alternates one time the the response is and the other one is so what's the what's the logic there what's going on there so there's this sefer which uh, written about um, about 170 years ago, or uh, no, no, so this this sefer was printed off of Ayn Dalad. So it's printed more than 200 years ago, and he has the following fascinating explanation. He says, when we talk about a a concern about the provision of water, there could be two types of concern. It could be that we are pleading in case Hashem had originally allocated that there would be a bracha of water, abundance of water, and there may be some reason that we we that that we um, have merited, if that's the right word, that it should be discontinued, that there shouldn't be a provision of water. So we're asking that Hashem should not withhold the provision of water which had been allocated already. It could be the other way around. It could be that there had been a decree that there shouldn't be a provision of water. And then the, the, the plea is that if there had been such a decree, that the decree should be overturned. And there should be, nevertheless, there should be a provision of water. So again, is the there could be a plea that if there had been a, a bracha for water, that, that bracha should not be withdrawn. There could be the other way around. That there's a bracha. Uh, that, that they had not been allocated, and we are asking to overturn that, that there should be a bracha nevertheless. And so now let's look at these six stages of characters, etc., tzaddikim. So we have those who had an experience they, with challenges with water, and they prevailed in tefillah, and, they were, and, and the, uh, the challenge was overcome, and water was provided. And then we have those who had no challenge with water, and whether it was tzaddikim. So Avram Avinu, we don't see any uh, experience in his life where there was a shortage of water. I know there was a family went down, but we don't see that he had a shortage of water per se. And therefore, we say, okay, in this schus of Avram, bavuro altim namoim. There's been allocated water in the schus of Avram. There's that, that allocation should not be withdrawn. Yitzchok, by contrast, had a, a parsha with the, with the with the wells, which we learned talk about this week in the Sedra, and so there was there, there was a, a business that he was seeking water, and he succeeded in getting water. So therefore, betzidkoi chun chashras moim in the merit of Yitzchok. So therefore, there should be a provision of water, even if there are challenges. We go to Yaakov. Yaakov does not have a, a problem with a shortage of water. And so in his course, we say, 
Bavore al Timna Moim, that the, the water should be, the brocha should remain, that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be withheld. Then we have Moshe Rabbeinu, so he does have a challenge with water. There's a time when the people, the Idnas, are, are um, short of water, uh, and they are uh, they are thirsty, and then there's a whole story with the rock. And so, in his merit, we should you should give us water nevertheless, even though there was a challenge. Later, we go to Aaron Akoin again. We don't see him having to deal with a shortage of water. And therefore, Bavor el And then we have the Shvotim. When they come to a place where there was uh, the water was was um, was bitter, and then so that they were they were they were challenged water wise. And therefore, we ask them that we ask in their merit that the if there is a challenge and there has been decreed there shouldn't be water, but Hashem should provide um, water in abundance. I mentioned that before that Avram. There was a, a famine in his time, but we don't see that he had a particular dealing with overcoming. He, he doesn't uh, he doesn't solve the water problem, whereas Yitzchak does, Moshe the Rabbeinu does, and so do the Shvotim. Well, with Moshe, with the um, with the uh, story with the bitter water. Okay, let's let's move on. And in the Sefer there also discusses the difference why you say sometimes Bavuroi, sometimes a Betzidko, but I don't want to go into that. Um, I just This is a Pashat um explanation. Okay. Now, I often daven at the Omid, not because, not only because I love davening at the Omid, but I like that things should be on time. And so, uh, so I go to the Omid. And then it's a weekday shacharis, and I um, looking around. We start saying Kaddish the Rabbonon. There's a letter of the Friedrich Rebbe printed in Sefer in Sefer Mamorim Top Shintes later in the Igris about the importance of saying the Kaddish the Rabbonon before davening. Okay, so I start saying Kaddish, and then as I've just said the first sentence, then someone in the back starts saying Kaddish. So he's a chiyuv, but he. Uh, I didn't know that he's a chiyu, whatever, so I'll say Kaddish. So now, do I have to finish the Kaddish which I've started, or can I just stop short, let him continue? This is my dilemma. So I just came across the Gemara, Bahar uh, Protis, in Gemara, the Brochus Daf Yedal, Adam and Beis. And, well, but let's start a similar Gemara, similar Loshan, is in Gemara, in Tainas Daf Chofches. So in Tainas Daf Chofches, it talks about Halil on Rosh Chaydash. So it tells, tells us the story. Rav comes to Bovel. He lived first in Eretz Yisrael. He comes to Bovel, and he sees that they're saying Halal and Rosh Chodesh. Never heard of such a thing. So he had considered to stop them. But then he saw that they are skipping parts. So he said, ah, I see that there's, that there's some, you know, the Minagav is saying be there. And there's, oh, evidently, there's been someone who had considered whether to how to introduce it and Dafkin not saying the full halal to differentiate between that and the days when we say halal as a duty, as a chiv. And so, all right, so he sees that it's, you know, it's, it's a responsible decision here, not just out of ignorance. And then it finishes off, Tono, we learned in Ebrahisa, Yochid lo yaschil. So although there is a custom of saying halal and rashaydesh, but the Yochid should not, if he did start, then he should finish off. So I'm not going to go into the whole halach of halal and rosh chodesh and that whole thing with Alter Rebbe about um, being yotze from the chazan, etc., etc. Written in about in, in the siddur, there's a lot of discussion about that. But I'm just picking up on this thing, this, this idea. Don't you, you shouldn't begin, but if you began, you finish the unit which you've started. So that's the Gemara in Tainas Daf Ches. Now we have here in Shukin Brochus Dafyudalid, so we have the following story. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Yehuda says that in Marovo, that in Eretz Yisrael, at Mairiv, now there's a whole question do you have to say the third parsha of Shema in the evening? Because after all, the third parsha has got to do with tzitzis, and by night it's not, there's no chiv to wear tzitzis, uh, because it says, Oreisem Oisoy. So there was a discussion, was a, an idea whether one needs to say the third parsha. 
So he says, in, in Eretz Yisrael, in the evening, they would say the following, They just said the first part and the last three words, with the word emes afterwards. Says Abaye, how man, I, what's so wonderful about this? But Rav Kanoz had said in the name of Rav, in the evening, Lo Yaschil, you don't don't need to start the third parsha. But if you started the third parsha, you have to say the whole parsha. Ah, you could say that the Omar to Alehem is is only a, how you say, a preamble. It's not a beginning of the actual content. It's, so, but Rabbi Shmuel by Yitzchok says, Dabe Abne Yisrael is take not a haskol, but Bomar Talem is a haskol. It's considered that you started. So, the Fofa says, all right, so in this point, whether Bomar Talem is a preamble or is a haskol, there's a machal that, that they did, don't agree. Until, unless you say, but also Lem Titsis. Then you already started saying the content of the Pash. So, Abai concludes, Anan. We start saying because even in Marovo they also would start. But then, once we start, then Robert said, if you start, then you have to finish. So, as we have the idea, as Rav Khan in the name of Rav had said, as we said before, so we're seeing an identical lotion that whether it's here, it's about the Shema, and here it's about Halal. But lo yaschil, you don't need, don't need to start. But if you start, you finish. So I'm I'm seeing a, svor, a similar svara here, that although I didn't have to say kaddish, but possibly I, I, I might be totally wrong. And I, and I looked around and couldn't find anyone who comments on this. Um, but in his goimer, we had a similar thing just this past week, that one it was on Rosh Chodesh, and there's a fellow who's a chiyu, and he on Rosh Chodesh is not diving at the yomit. At the end of a halal, so he started saying Kaddish. And then says, so, no, 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 it's, it's a Kaddish for the Chazan, it's not your Kaddish. So the, the, these are not the same. One was st starting uh, Kaddish um, legitimately, and but then someone else comes in. There, perhaps you could say it wasn't his business to say Kaddish at all, so he stopped. Not quite he stopped, but I uh, just find it interesting. Um, to, to see the Svaras here. Right. Let's move on. So now I was did now in the, uh, in the in, uh, I was at the Kinnus HaShluchim in New York and uh, a couple of people I don't know whether they had any connection with one another asking about Kale Erech which we say on Mondays and Thursdays has that got to do with Kriya Satayr? So this is, you can see a picture from the Tilas Hashem Siddha, I think, or Torah Siddha, that on Sheni Vachamishi, on Mondays and Thursdays, after Tachnu, after Kaddish, before Kriyas, before opening the Koran Kodesh, or even Soya, we have this passage of Kela Rechapayim. Now, has that got to do with Kriya Satayr? In other words, if you, for whatever reason, are not davening with a minion, do you still say that passage because it is Monday and Thursday? Or has it got to do with, it's a preamble to Kriya Satayr, like by Hebe and Sayarim? Uh, another variation of the same question, if let's say you're uh, one of the slower uh, daveners in the minion, and so you're in the middle of St. Tachnon, and they've opened the Goran Kodesh, and now, so do you interrupt in the middle of your sequence of uh, of Tachnon? Of course, Vahibin Soya and Vahibin Shmei is, is time sensitive, so you're going to say it then. What about Kehler Chapayim? Is it also time sensitive to be said, said then or can you just leave it when you get there when you finished uh, eventually you'll say it um where it belongs in the siddha so this is the question is it is this a, a prayer to be said on Mondays and thursdays or is it a preamble to kriya satayra i told them off the cuff that it's a preamble to kriya satayra in the siddha in the notes which i'd written in the siddha i'd discussed this and you can see on the left that the uh, this is Written the Sefer Isha Yisrael quotes from Rabbi Shlomo Zalman Oyabach that it's a mispal v'yochid does not say keler chapayim and that it is a preamble to Kriya Satayra. Just to um, support that, on the right side of the screen you have a, a quote from the Mate Moshe. To fill you in, the Mate Moshe is a Talmud of the Maharshal. Um, he 
And his safer is all reasons for explanations, backgrounds for in Yonim of Davening, etc. So he writes on Mondays and Thursdays, what's the significance of saying this plea at this point? So he says, because we're going to now read in the Torah, and we are aware that we have violated the Torah uh, in, in some occasion, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu is Marich Apoy, he's, he's uh, patient with us, with his great mercy and kindness. Therefore, as we're about to read the Torah, we say Kehler Chapayim before we start saying Kriya Torah, but reading the Torah. Fascinating. So it's, it's, it's a kind of, because we're going to read the Torah, and it might be a reflection on, on, of guilt on upon us, therefore we ask for a special filler that we should be in, uh, we shouldn't be uh, punished, so to speak, for for that those violations. Um, but it's clearly his saying has got to do with Kriya Torah. What I remember also, and the Sid I refer to this, is that the Abu Darham says that this also apply, applies on a fast day. If you'd have a uh, sorry, Batavis, let's say, if that would be on on a Tuesday, so it also it, it'd be it'd say Kelar Chapaim because it's an introduction to Kriya Torah. It's not limited to Mondays and Thursdays. It's it's got to do with it. it's a preamble to Kriya Torah. Um, Now, Reb Naftali is writing here, there was once in this upstairs Zahal, someone began saying Kaddish at the wrong time. People tried to shush him, and the Rebbe says, Lozim Endekin, let him finish off uh, the Kaddish. Yes, uh, oh, thank you for reminding me about that. That, I believe, was on Rosh Chodesh. Now, what we do normally on Rosh Chodesh, we don't finish off of all that's seen aloud, so that, uh, otherwise, you'd have to say Kaddish, and, there, and instead, we um, bring back the Sefer Torah without a Kaddish, switch off, to take off Rashi's and put a Rebbe Tams, and then we start with say Kaddish and start off uh, Musaf. Now this fellow had said the Kaddish when, you know, earlier than necessary, than appropriate, and yes, thank you. So that's uh, supporting this idea that even though um, he shouldn't have been saying Kaddish then, and it was a whole whole um, confusion, but the Rebbe said to finish off. Although I don't know how far he had gone, but okay, that's... Uh, we have certainly a plastical mindset out to support this, that once you've started, you, you finish the Kaddish. Thank you. Let's move on to the next point. Fascinating. As I'm in, in the, the United States, it's about 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock, whatever, in uh, New York, and I get a phone call from someone who is, he says, I'm traveling. This is on Monday. It's Air Rosh Chodesh. I'm traveling to Hong Kong via Japan. And so he's traveling across the Pacific. And it's, he's, let's, he says about to get onto the plane. Let's say his plane, his, his departure is two o'clock. Now, since he's traveling along with the sun, he's going to have a very long afternoon. And it's going to remain light for most of the journey. And when by the time he lands in Japan, it's going to be nightfall. Now, because it's crossing the dateline, he will be going from, on, you know, it will be instead of Monday afternoon, by the time he lands in Japan, it will be Tuesday afternoon, actually Tuesday evening. So he will have missed out on Rosh Chayda. She says, what do I do about Halil, about Musaf, etc.? So as I say, it was very much on the spur of the moment. And I was. T I told him. I think that you, ch since you're going to a new day, you should daven again, um, sh shachris, etc., and musaf. But I said to him that the mumche on this is actually Rabbi Leshes in Melbourne, who's done a lot of research. It's the rov of the um, Tzire, uh, yeshiva, or whatever, the young yeshiva, a minion. And I right afterwards, I sent an email to Rabbi Leshes and asked him how do they paskin. Now, I hadn't considered when I told him to daven Shachris again, you know what? It's going to, it's going to, it's not going to get earlier. It's going to, he's traveling at two o'clock. Let's say it's going to, he, he's not going to get earlier in time. It'll be two o'clock, three o'clock, etc. It's not going to go back to Shachris time. So there was no reason for him to have to go back to Shachris. But, but he would, once he crosses the dateline, he would be able to 
uh, Davin Musaf, etc. So that's that's the all right. So now this is the, what happened on, on Monday, and then I'm going to share with you Rabbi Lesh's answer. Yeah. So here you go. He writes the consensus in Australia. Well, that's in the Rabono, I guess. That there's there's the, there's the day there's the time of the day, and there is the date. So when you cross the date line, it's still the same day, and therefore you don't have to do shachris again or mincha again. It's still the same day, but it's a different date. So it will change from Monday to Tuesday. It will change from erev Rosh Chodesh to Rosh Chodesh, etc. Therefore, in our instance, he writes that he's travelled on erev Rosh Chodesh, and his and um, so now uh, he would he would once he crosses the date line, it would become Rosh Chodesh for him, and on that basis he would daven uh, mincha. He would say Yalav Yov at mincha. He would say Halel. He could daven Musaf once he's crossed the date line. He says that's the majority of the rabbanim in Melbourne who would say. You go by your current location. So once you're past the date line, there's a whole discussion. Where is the date line? But once you are satisfied that you crossed the halacha date line, so at that point it becomes from Monday to Tuesday, and it becomes eros chodesh becomes rosh chodesh, and you'll daven a musaf and a halal and etc. However, Reb Chaim Svi Grona, son of the late Reb Yitzchok Grona, uh, says no, and he says you're bound by your original location regardless of the fact that you've traveled across the date across the date line and so actually rabbi graham Hansvi was in new york and he posted this uh guidance uh on on the i guess from the australian Schluchen, um, ch chat or, or line or whatever it's called and he says that those who are leaving on monday night which is rosh Chodesh, and they will arrive on wednesday so he says that they should, they will keep American time. They'll still say Shachris and the Alav Yovah, even if they cross the date line in flight. This is based upon the Rebbe's Psaq, that your, your, your day follows your point of origin until you have, and arrive at your destination and disembark. Now, as, as the Rebbe Lesha says, the Rebbe's, uh, un, uh, Rebbe's answer in relation to his mother's travels. Now, the background to this. Um, actually, I heard this years ago, and subsequently, I, I, and I wrote it up, and then subsequently, after Rabbi Label Grona passed away, they found in his archives his version of how he's, well, you know, he was there at the time. So the story is the following: that Rabbi Itzchok Dovi Grona went to Australia to live there as a shliach. In around 1963. His wife had just given birth and as a result she wasn't ready to travel, a uh, long journey, and several months later she gets on a train from New York to Los Angeles and at, in Los Angeles she gets onto a boat with her six kinderlach and at some stage she looks at the schedule of the boat arrival in Sydney and it's going to be arriving on Sunday which in American uh, days would be still Shabbos. So this, this, so she had this dilemma. What's she going to do? She'll be, if, according to what her counting, that she'll be arriving on Shabbos, she'll have a problem of getting off the boat. So she sent a telegram to her husband who contacted his brother. Her husband was in Melbourne, and he contacted his brother, Reb Label, who was in New York. I asked the Rebbe, and the Rebbe told him, to ask this role for uh, um, his take on it, another one, and there wasn't satisfied. And third one, I believe, was Rabbi Nachman Kasher, who had written extensively about the halacha dateline, and he uh, gave the following advice, which the Rebbe was happy with. And what this was relayed to Mrs. Groner on the boat, and the following a guidance that once they have, once the captain announces they've crossed the dateline. They should try to get off the boat at a port, obviously, um, and disembark 
if possible, to spend a night in, in that location. If not, at least to have a, a meal, to sit down and to be kavua. Once they've, once they've settled, so to speak, on the other side of the dateline, then they can align themselves with the timing as in Australia rather than the timing of America, and they would be able to therefore be landing on Sunday rather than Shabbos. So what, what, what's being understood from this is that if you haven't disembarked, you're still bound by your um, point of departure time, um, even though you've crossed the dateline. That's, 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 the, uh, that's where he's coming from. Now, then I'm going to share with you, this I also heard from Rabbi Grana Olav Shalom, and eventually Chaim Svi um, found this in, the, in his files, in father's files, and he shared this with me. Again, this is printed up in Nesiva Mr. Ashlichas, volume Gimel. So this is a Isarusa de la Eila. Rabbi Groner was in, Rabbi Icha Groner was in New York, and the Rebbe gives him such a, gives him a job. Yevare Psak Din Rav. Rabbi Icha Groner himself was a, an eminent Tamad Chochem, but I believe the Rebbe was referring to him to Get a a more you know uh, solid psak, get verify and get an, a decision of a rock. Hanichnas ba'aviron beyom vov, one who enters a plane on a Friday, ba'aviron mamshich belihev sek yirida hanaya barets, and the plane continues without a stop landing on the ground. It's just continued. Continues to fly. And you're still on the plane, it's still flying, and it's already now past sunset where you've left. What's the halacha? So let's say if we would take a plane in winter, or let's say a 10 o'clock flight. So this would arrive in, in uh, New York, in New York time, let's say one o'clock. But in English time, it would be six o'clock. So in the winter, that would be well into Shabbos. And so Rebbe is asking, what is, what's the halacha? Are you allowed to travel in a way that before you land, it's already Shabbos in the place where you departed from? So this seems to be a similar approach that although in your, in real time, where you are now, it's not Shabbos yet, but you are still possibly bound by the Shabbos of where you left. At the time, Rabbi Grona did discuss this. This is Tovshin Mem, approximately. He discusses this with Reb Zalman Shimon Dvorakin, uh, who said that Lachat Chile, you shouldn't travel in such a way. Um, if you did, when you arrive at your destination, you're going to have to be Mechabal Shabbos immediately, even though it's well before Plag HaMincha. That was Reb Zalman Shimon's Psaq. But meanwhile, what we're seeing here is an idea that you still maintain the status of your point of departure until you land. What I would just suggest, though, is that this is, you have the idea in in Gemara Psochim, in Mokim Shinagu, Noisnin Olof Chumre HaMokim Shiyotsim Isham, etc. There is such a concept that the that the stringencies of the your point of departure will apply until you become a local in, in a different location. I'm not sure whether that is a chumra or it is a, a hard and fast halacha. Uh, would that be also used lakula? And therefore I'm asking here, this is, seems to be where Chaim Tzvi's um, svora, that you're bound by, you're still a uh, an American time, and therefore it's Rosh Chodesh, in his case, until you until you land in in Australia, um, because you're going to I'm, I'm wondering whether that is just a, a luchumra or also, or, and perhaps and therefore, but if it's just luchumra, then perhaps you should you should say halal and you should say musaf because the ikir is you should go according to where you are, but as far as Shabbos is concerned, you should be machmir not to uh, not to take such a trip. Because of the Khumra, perhaps you should be bound by the Mokim Yitziosa. I'm not sure, but I haven't seen anything in writing about this from Rabbi Groner, but uh, I'm just wondering. And as uh, so you see, that you got this, what Rabbi Lashis is saying, the majority of the Rabbanin there take the view 
uh, you go according to the current location once you've crossed the dateline and um, so you'd you'd look at the real time um whereas we have that other opinion okay so if you are taking trips to australia crossing the dateline um ask your um uh, Ask a Shaila before you do, um, more than half an hour before takeoff. Okay, let's move on. Now, here's someone, now we discussed this not long ago, and I went at the Kinos on the Friday night. So a someone, a Shliach in Manhattan, who does, uh, is doing a lot of activity of getting young people together. And, they, and now this is a big Osiris of getting tzitzis for, for the soldiers in Eretz Yisrael. And so he has 100, 150 people coming together in the, um, putting in tzitzis. So one thing about putting tzitzis in the evening, that's not a problem. Most most posts can say that it's no problem to put in tzitzis at night. Um, what about women? So we've gone through this, that the al Rebbe says, the halacha is that it is kosher, it's a lechatchila, zahir is lechatchila, to do a kisvara ha'achroinot, that women shouldn't be putting in tzitzis. Okay. So there was a svara, which he also discussed with other abonim. If you have a man to, to do the first first uh, knots and the and chulio, then the, can, the continuation can be done um, by women without any um, worry. What about children? So then, what we're seeing here is a, the way the Alter Rebbe presents this. According to this shita that women wouldn't be qualified to make tzitzis, therefore cotton also wouldn't be qualified. Even if a godl is standing over there, but uh, which which tells us, according to the psak halacha, which is the ikir hadin, that they would be qualified. And I about kavana, so the fact that there's a godl omidal gabov, then that would be uh, acceptable. So all right. The, the, then he asked, what about goyim? Now, yeah, why would goyim want to put in sitzis? So uh, the, the reality is that in the crowd which is coming, some of them may be. From non-kosher conversions, etc., they're not so they're not yidden lahalocha, but they're still part of uh, they're coming to social groups, etc., and it's not always so easy to uh, to uh, to not allow them to be there. So would he be allowed to leave them to put in sitzes? And here the answer is no. What we're seeing here is that it says clearly a goy for put in sitzes. It's possible because. Putting in tzitzis is like a mitzvah, yeah? It says, V'osu lahem tzitzis. So not just the wearing of the tzitzis, but V'osu lahem tzitzis. V'nei Yisroel, yeah? V'nei Yisroel V'osu lahem tzitzis. Uh, Eden put in tzitzis. Therefore, if a guy makes tzitzis, that would not be okay. That's so... Uh, how is he going to de deal with the de diplomacy? That's... I'll leave to him. He's a very wise person. And now he'll manage that. Okay. Now, someone asked me a totally unrelated question to any of our discussion till now. He wanted, well, slightly related. He feels that he wants to support Eretz Israel at this time. And he has some money which he wants to put in uh, by Israeli bonds. And he's asking, is there a Shaila of Ribis? So uh, I guess the bonds is you buy, you, you buy a bond and in time it would mature and uh, increase in value. So is that a question of, of Ribis? So... What he, he he dug up a letter. I told him to inquire. He got, dug up a letter from Reb Mitzir Meir Chai Uziel, who was the Sfardish Rav uh, This is going back in Tovshin Yud Base in 1952. And what I, I found this letter, I did a search on it, and I found it in uh, published in the Hamora Journal. So he's talking about the the uh, Storis Milvet. The, the bond is a kind of a, a loan which is being sold in America, lo loans for the Israeli government. So he says actually it's not a it's not a loan as such. It's, it's colloquially known as as a loan, but actually it's actually a partnership. You're going a uh, you you're entering into a partnership, investing together with them, and um, that's what the the bond is. Um, it goes into details about this and. Therefore, you are buying a share in a business which is generating an income. Therefore, you are entitled to get a return on that. So it's a partnership. It's not a loan. However, he says, nevertheless, it was instituted through the Ministry of Religion that, that all of the bonds will be under, under the terms of Heter Iska 
as is in all the Jewish banks in Eretz Yisrael, that they are um, uh, done with the guidance of Heter Iska, which is a way which is that the investments are seen as investments and not as loans, and uh, therefore the, 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 the bonds are subject to Heter Iska. So it's, uh, it's okay. Right. Let's move. Let's see. Someone's asking. So a batch of this is where there would be an issue with Goyim having made them kosher, called the Porsche. That's a very interesting question. Um, can you rely on Roy? So let's say if you have a, a, a lots of mezuzahs and one of them is possible and you don't know which one it is, can you rely on Roy? There's a whole question because Roy is only for Bittal of Isurim. But does Roy help to make a, a mitzvah? Can you does, does it make a mezuzah kosher? That's that's a question which is discussed in Poskim, and they're not so keen about it. Okay, let's move on. Um, so someone, one of our listeners, is asking a few things about davening, and the first one is about l'shem yichud. In other sidurim, as in particularly nusach sfard, as in lechsidish nusach, you have a l'shem yichud before every mitzvah, such as Hashem Yechud, before tzitzis, and before tefillin, before kriya, and maybe before lulav, and before sfira soime. And in our siddur, those, they're not there. But we do have a Hashem Yechud, which they don't have, and that is before Baruch Shoma. And so, what is the ex explanation for all of this? I think it would be interesting to ask, just the Yidim Basino in the Shtibel, ask, what does it actually mean, this Hashem Yechud, Kutshablich, Hoshchinte? A bit shat of this. Well, what, what are you exactly trying to say? It's this is a poshat, yeah. But meanwhile, here what you have here on the screen is from the Kutasiches Chelik Lamed Tes, and this is a sicha about the policy of the Alter Rebbe in uh, the Siddur Bichlal. It's particularly, if I'm not mistaken, it's talking about the Rosh Hashanah, the preparation for Tkias. But meanwhile, it's an overall understanding of what's the Alter Rebbe's policy in the Siddur. So he, let's read this carefully. So he says, in Sifri Kabbalah, it's written that before every mitzvah, before performing a mitzvah, you should say, you're doing this, the shame yichud kutshav richo shkinte, to uh, create a yichud of various levels of godliness. And Mary, in various Siddur, this is published to be said before every mitzvah. And we find amazing in, in, in Alter Rebbe Siddur, there is no Lashem Yuchud before every mitzvah. But on the other hand, it's been inst in, in, installed to be said every day before Baruch So the, it, there is written elsewhere, they have Mavur Bozeh, this is in the mime of the Rebbe Rashab, that we say Lashem Yuchud once a day. And we have in mind also with that, with the Yitzhah, with all the mitzvahs of the day. But the question is, if l'shem yichud, if we're saying l'shem yichud, is a hanhogia, which is shaykhus to most of us, so why isn't it put there? And if l'shem yichud is a little bit too kabbalistic from us, or too, we don't understand what we're saying, so why is it there before Baruch Shama? And so here the Rebbe comes along with a very, you going what he said earlier in this in this sicha, a very interesting uh, approach, almost like you'd say the gavra and the chefs. And he's saying that although the gavra, the individuals, may not be uh, on par to understand all the kavonas of the Arizal, or Kabbalah kavonas, but the hefts of the siddha which they're using is 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 it is in tune with all of these kavonas, and therefore when you're using this, you are using this nusach and this siddha, you're connecting with those kavonas, even though you're not necessarily mindful of those kavonas. That's more or less. Uh, what the Rebbe is saying over there. And having said that, the Rebbe says, takes it one step further. But the Alter Rebbe is of the opinion that one should say the Shem Yuchud at least once a day, and that will have the influence of the Shem Yuchud for all the, for all the mitzvahs done during that day. It, it's not Shove Luchol Nefesh, it's not um, it's not it's not reachable, or it's not suitable for most of us to have the L'shem Yuchud Kavona for every mitzvah during the day, but we should at least, and when it comes the moment of davening, and it's the beginning of the day, and just before, then you know, it's just before Baruch Shama, after that you're not allowed to interrupt. 
So before Baruch Shom, just before going to Baruch Shom, so at that point we insert a l'shem yichud, but that should that's a moment of focus to a degree, and that should be the l'shem yichud for the whole day. That's the whatever uh, sikh on this. Okay. Let's move on. The next question he has was about the psukim before and after Mayim Achroinim. What's the relevance of those psukim? Now, the posik before is a posik from Eyov, Zechelik, Adam Rosha, Meli, Kim, and Nachlas, Imre, Mikhail. Now, the, the, the concept here is, and some people don't say this, but in Art Nusuch it's there, it's as if to give clipper a little bit, like you throw a bone to the dog and keep the dog happy. So there is this idea of washing my machroidim, and that water is a kind of a unique, giving a little gleaning to clipper and let them have this, this little bit and not not not, not interfere any anymore. The words chelik odom rosho, rosho tevis spell alef chesreish, and the washing of acher. And so this is a, a, a unique Fusitra Akhra, which we discussed before. There's the Sikhs of the Fede Rebbe mentioned about not using a silver dish for the pouring of the Maim Akhroinim. You don't want to, on the contrary, it's a, uh, it's a, low, it's a lowly thing. It's, it's, it's giving to clippers, so you don't make it fancy. Um, so that's the Posuk before. The Posuk after, I did not see an explanation. But it's fairly evident that uh, there's an also interesting question. Is Vayadabe Eli connected to Mayim Machroinim? And if, if for whatever reason you're not able to do Mayim Machroinim, you don't have any water. But you, I've, uh, it doesn't seem to be a Svara that has to be Dafka connected to Mayim Machroinim. It's just, um, it's saying that this table is a, is a Shulchan Shalaf Hashem. Possibly it is related that once we have kind of given uh, the the gleaning for Sitra Akhra, and now the table is the Shulchan of Hashem, it's a table before Hashem. Uh, and so in other words, to bring out the, the Kedusha and the Avedis Hashem of the of this table. Okay. Now let's about uh, once since, since we've come on to discussing this, I want to share you with you something very, very interesting. So we have here Posuk in in Yecheskel. Now, you know, the Cheskel has a, uh, a vision and he has a, a Malach, gives him a guided tour of the future Beis Amigdosh, of the third Beis Amigdosh, and he's shown the Mizbeach. The wooden Mizbeach is, stands three Amas high. It's two Amas um, tall and it's got corners. Um, it's all made of wood. So this is where this posuk is from. The posuk in before my after my achronim, you can see it's from Yeches called Mem Aleph Kofbeis. So the Gemara in several places, but here we have from Baruchas Daf Nun Hey. So he says the following. Um, he says there are various activities which are, are uh, merit Ariches Yom, um, long life. So Hamarich Al Shulchan. One who spends a long time at his table. What's the merit in that? Possibly a poor person will come and there's food at the table. So you'll give them some food from your table. Where do we see that there's a merit in, in your, your table and uh, hosting, etc.? Okay. And then it says, and the Malach says to me, this is the table to Hashem. So So the Posach starts off talking about a Mizbeach, and then it switches, it says, so how do you reconcile that? Says Rabbi Yechon and Rabbi Lozor, when the Beis HaVikdash is standing, so the Mizbeach mechapa al Yisrael. And then the Mizbeach is a source of, uh, of atonement. The Achshav, now that we don't have a Mizbeach, we don't have the base of Mikdosh, Shulchone Shul Odom Mechaper Olav. So the table is an atonement. Very nice. So we have here that the, um, I know that some elsewhere it says about the, 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 the table, but the Poshtab Shadli Gemara here is 
Dilma Ose Anyo of Yohivale. It's an opportunity of, of, of hosting a poor person, giving them food. Meanwhile, what we're seeing here is that the Mizbeach is, how do you say, is substituted for by the Shulchan. The table is uh, is a substitute for the for Mizbeach. Now, I want to share with you a fascinating insight. Look at the Rambam over here. In the Rambam in Hilchus Beis Abchira, Perik Beis. Talks about the Mizbeach, and towards the end of the chapter, he writes that the exact dimensions of a mizbeach are not totally imperative, that the minimum size of a mizbeach would be the amo al amo, a square amo, beroim sholish amos, in the height of three amos, which is the area of the mekoim hamarocha where the fire would be on the mizbeach in the midbar. So the mizbeach in the altar in the midbar in the desert was five amos square. The corners which jutted out were an amo square, and then there's a little pathway for the Koyanim to be able to walk around. So the actual fire area was just one arm square. It also says in Chumash, like it says over here, about the Mizbech being three arms high. Although Chazal learned that that's only the upper half of the Mizbech, there was lower half, and the Mizbech stood the total ten arms high. But meanwhile, the way it's written literally in the Apostle is the Mizbech is three arms high. So what we're seeing is the minimum Mizbech is an arm by an arm by three arms. Now, Anyone who's familiar with uh, anything about the mikveh knows that the smallest mikveh is an amo al amo al is three cubic amo. And so the smallest mizbeach is the size of a the, the smallest mikveh, which is not a surprise because the mizbeach, as uh, the Rambam in the beginning says, that the earth um, for the formation of Odom was taken from uh, this place of the Mizbeach, Odo Mimokin Kaparos in Ivro. So the Mizbeach is to atone for a person. And so it makes sense that the size of the minimum size of the Mizbeach is the size of uh, the um, dimensions of, uh, which accommodate a person. So one, the Mizbeach atones for the person. Now, here's a very interesting thing. The Shulchan in the, in the Beis HaMikdosh, in the way it's described in Pashas Trumo, measures one Ammo by two Amis, and it's one and a half Amis high. I'm not going to go to whole Arichas, but of course those who've got their mathematic heads are screwed on now. One by two by one and a half equals three. So the overall dimensions of the of the Shulchan are also, if you had wanted to make a mikvah to fit in the uh, the Shulchan, you'd, if you'd make it one and a half amas deep, one by two amas, it would be a kosher mikvah, it would be containing three cubic amas. And the shulchan would fit in. So you've got the shulchan, the, the also is the same size of a mikveh. So what we're seeing a fascinating thing is that the shulchan substitutes for the mizbeach. We say that now we don't have a base of mikdash. The shulchan substitutes for the mizbeach, and the the, the uh, dimensions of the of the shulchan in the base of in the mishkan uh, are are the same as a sheer mikveh, which is the same as a sheer of the mizbeach. And so it makes sense that that one substitutes for the other. Um, not Nigel Halachim, but fascinating. Right, one last thing about this So, this is the safest. I think is a little bit before the Alter Rebbe's time, not, 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 not too much earlier. And he's quoting from the Yarizal, and here he actually says to say the Psukim of. Avorcho, etc. After my Machreinu, we don't follow that. Maybe that's because of Heschadas interruption. But meanwhile, he says you should say the positive Aida Be'elai, and then go straight into um, into benching. And he says he the impression from the Kisvi Arizal is Aida Be'elai Zerushulchan is only said when it's said Bezimun. I did I my little uh, little research. I did not see that. And certainly doesn't say such a thing. And we say that possibly also when we're benching alone. Um, one thing which I did pick up whilst I was um, dabbling tonight was a story that someone, uh, Reb Chaim Vital says, he was he was there in the presence of his Rebbe, of the Arizal, and someone came along and he said that he's been suffering pain in his shoulder. So the Arizal said to him, 
it looks like that you have been interrupting between um, between the tirs yadayim of my machroinim and and your benching. He was learning mishnayos at the table. He would wash my machroinim, say a peik mishnayos, and then bench. And he says you have the lot and take care from tirs yadayim brocha. The word take care, which means immediate, is the same lot, the same letters as the word kosi, which means the shoulder. So this is the background for this these few lines over here that uh, because he was neglecting the Indian of takeif, therefore he was he was uh, suffering pain in his shoulder, and um, by being careful about this would be to take away this his pain in the shoulder. Right, let's move on. Okay, so then the next question he had was about the la after Harlow. So we have now well, let's go back to that previous slide. Uh, okay, so we have in. He has two questions about Halil. One is about the word Al. What is the, this word Al is put in brackets. So why is it, if it's in, if it shouldn't be said, why is it there? Um, he mentions about, in the person's writing to me, about, about the Bashamru, that the Alter Rebbe put it in to be, uh, to placate the uh, grandson of the Baditshava. Um, I just want to, on a, on a historical note, I've heard the story many times in various versions and various Hasidisha uh, groups. This story is told, whether it's this Enikul, that Enikul. Um, just got a little bit of news to you. The Alter Rebbe publishes his Siddha in the Yatok of Samach Gimel. Well, that's the print which we have. And the Shomru is there. Um, the Hasana with the Baditshiva, with the Baditshiva's grandsons, is several years later. The Zhlob and the Chasna, etc. There were two Chasnas, and they were much uh, several years after the Siddha was published. Therefore, to say that the Alter Rebbe inserted the Shamru to placate his Mechutan or his whatever it is, it's simply historically not true. Um, the the conversation may have been, why did the Alter Rebbe say not to say the Shamru? And so the Alter Rebbe says, but Nita, that you can't uh, because the Shamru becomes a whole Yarid Lamaila becomes a whole. Uh, celebration and the Alter Rebbe says, Nitafala, you didn't come before, and you can't go to every fair and every 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 uh, celebration. So, and the Alter Rebbe didn't want to say, I uh, didn't want to say the Shomra because of a hefsik, etc. So, they, they, they to say that it was because of an interaction with someone and to placate them, that's just, and uh, that's why he put it in. That's not true. Um, all right, but meanwhile, come back to our main question things which are in the Alter Rebbe Siddur. The late Rabbi Shua Monshen, uh, once wrote to me, he had this list of six or eight places where there's a word in brackets. And we have the Moshul Altosir, Loisosur, we have Rechenshin, Echsuvim, Vachan, etc. So this is one of those places where we have a bracket in the Alter Rebbe Siddur. You have also in Pichir Ovis, Rebbe Loza Ben Chismo, or Rebbe Loza Chismo. What's the significance of these brackets? So let's read these words. All of your creations shall praise you. Or we, they shall praise you for all what you have wrought. Both are legitimate messages. And okay, we can only choose one or the other. Possibly the brackets are there to be aware that there's another pshat. It's okay, it's shivim ponim la Torah. So there's one way we're going to do gula maisa, but it's okay to know that there's another pshat, which is also perhaps relevant even for Shabbat Chol Nefesh, to know that there's another pshat. So for example, v'chein shnei chsuvim, so v'chan. So although there may be in, our, in, in the original Torah's koyanim, there's v'chan shnei chsuvim, um, and the, okay. So there, there, there's an explanation that there it means in the original place, in Torah's Koenim, it, the Vachan Shnei Chzuvim fits better. And yet in Posh Pshat, when you're davening, the Vachan doesn't fit because there's no Vachan. You're not, you're not, it's not a commentary on a Chumash or anything. And therefore, it's it's said as Vachan Shnei Chzuvim. That, that's okay. Uh, and so on. Um, I know that, for example, on Toltani Rucha, so that's not from the Alter Rebbe, on to, there, there's a Nusach on Tolasni from the Tzemach Tzedek, Okay, so possibly these are added there for a person who's a little bit more understanding to understand. Okay, there's the there's a way which we're going to say lamaisa, but also you should know that there's another way of, of reading it, etc. Um, I'm going to read here a couple of the um, comments in the chat. 
So Naftali is saying, I thought it was because of his friendship with Rebbe Yitzchak, who defended, who defended the Alter Rebbe, independent of them being Mechotanim. Um, if, if not this, why should it be included at all? So, um, all right. The Alter Rebbe does bring it because it was possibly, he doesn't even say you shouldn't say it. What he says is, that he puts it there, and most chassidim do say it. He says, if you don't say Baruch Hashem Le'olam, you don't say Yisrael, you don't say Vashamru either. He kind of leaves it a little bit, uh, a little bit open. Um, very, very interesting. I, I'm, I'm just saying this uh, off the cuff kind of thing. Coming back to what we had earlier this evening about this Kela Echapai, because here this is inconsistent. The list over here, which dates not to say Kela Echapai, is inconsistent with the list which is before Lam Natsech, of days we don't say Tachnon. And uh, Rabbi Tubi Yabloi Zolzang is and he's suggesting that the Rebbe is presenting there's this option, and later he says, well, Minak Sfard is another option. It's it's possible that the Alter Rebbe would present, um, I know, Der uh, Ashvi don't understand this, possibly, but possibly the Alter Rebbe would, would allow you to know that there's two options. And okay, so you have the Harchobas HaMoichin. This is the way we're doing it. But you know that there are others, and they're you know they're, they're also uh, part of uh, of Claudius Royal, etc. Um, I once heard a very nice shot. It was when you didn't cross the the Yamsuf, so they go through twelve tunnels, and there's the the uh, the um, Medrash says that the the, the walls of the tunnels were were clear like glass. You can see. So why was it important that they should see the other uh, the people in the other tunnels? So this is not all about Shavuot. They're saying there's 12 tunnels and there's Yitin going each one in a different tunnel. But if you know, you're going in your tunnel, you'll get to the destination. They're going in a different tunnel, but they're also going to get to the same destination. Um, that's why you have to know that there are other tunnels. Yeah, the other Yitin in other tunnels. It's okay, it's legitimate. Um, the other point which he's asking, asking is about the Vavrom Zokain. And Zvodya Yishmureni. Now, I think we've gone through this before that the name Zvodya is the idea of um, Hashem carrying your your package, your burden. And so the Zion is from the word Zokin, and the base is from the word Bo, and the Dal that somehow comes with Yomim with a Mem and Dal, etc. And so we on Rish Chodesh, we mentioned in this Posuk, and it's a school of Arichas Yomim. Ram Zokin, Baba Yomim. And we, we add this lotion. His question was, do we say first the Posuk three times and then the the uh, this filler afterwards, or do we say it all in one go? And what I have in my notes uh, I saw this evening is that there are Svardish Sidurim, which say say the Posuk three times and then say this Zvodi uh, Shmarini once. Um, whereas in Hayoim Yoim, so we have this lotion of um Koif, uh, sorry, but Avram Zokin. Uh, so what does the Hayom Yom added to what's written in the Siddur, where it says So there's a, a recent publication of called Hayom Yom Hamavur. He wants to say this is the very point which he wants to confirm. Unlike those who think who say, say that you should first say the pasuk three times and then say the lachash three times, no, it says calls the Yom Hagim Sorry, where it is to so say the, the to say the Posuk and the Zavod Yishmerin just say it three times. Um, in other words, say the two pieces um, one after the other, and then to say it again the two pieces one after the other all in all three times. Okay, with that we'll finish for tonight. I wish you all, I wish you have a good tovoch, and we should hear Besuris Toivus and Arichas Yomim and Geula. We should see a Yeshua from the Eden in uh, captivity uh, in, in, in Aza. And we should see all uh, the soldiers come out and come home safely. And uh, we should see a good old shleim of the Mashiach Zedkain of Meheri Omeinu Mamish. I go to the Lord.